Now Lebel to the right hand, puts her down. He's going to dump him hard to the ice. Brady Lebel just loves to fight. Ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. My dream of being a professional hockey player became a reality, but it was all taken away from me in a very short period of time. For many years, hockey was my outlet. Hockey was my drug. When I had a stick in my hand, nothing else mattered. I was able to break into the Western Hockey League in 2004, and I even won the Swift Current Broncos Rookie of the Year. During the summer of my rookie year, I experimented with drugs for the first time. After just seven games in my sophomore season, I walked away from the Swift Current Broncos due to personal reasons. Nobody knew I had been sexually abused at the age of five. I did everything to hide it from everybody, but I just couldn't take it. Drugs and alcohol now took over my life. I did return to the Swift Current Broncos as a 19-year-old, but things were never the same. I was eventually traded to the Kelowna Rockets in my final year of junior where I got to play on a line with the Dallas Stars captain, Jamie Benn, and one of my best friends, the extremely talented Colin Long. It was by far my best season ever, and I even signed with the Tampa Bay Lightning's organization. A dream come true, right? That's when everything went wrong. First it was the cocaine, then came the Oxycontin, and that led me into a 12-year journey into the deepest pits of hell. Within two years, I had now made the switch to heroin, fentanyl, and everything in between, and I was now an intravenous drug user. Multiple suicide attempts and over five trips to the psych ward, I was a shadow of who I once was. By 2014, I was homeless on Hastings in Vancouver, the worst street in North America. By 2015, I was a wanted criminal, making the Crime Stopper headlines more than once. After spending three years in jail, I had completely given up. With nowhere to turn and nowhere to go, I finally started to get honest. I took a chance and made some major changes. This is my story. Someone, where's your emergency? Someone overdosed? What's the address? I overdosed over 10 times. I'm one of the lucky ones. And for that, I will always be grateful. This is for all the men and women we've lost. Matthew Lazinski, Mitch Fadden, this one's for you. My name's Brady Liebold, and I've been to hell and back. This is the road to recovery. What is going on? Welcome. Hockey to hell and back episode number 102. I'm Brady Liebold. Coming at you live from beautiful Muskoka, Ontario. I'll tell you what, though. It's a little bit cold up here today. I had to get my team-issued sweatpants on just before popping on here. I don't know what's going on. It's January, it feels like, these last couple of days. But, hey, if you're watching live, thank you so much. If you're listening after the fact, thank you so much. Share it with your friends. If you're on YouTube, press like, press subscribe. All that stuff you hear people say that I never thought I would say at almost 35 years old, here I am saying it. But thank you to everyone who supported me in this show and puck support and everything because I know I say it all the time. But, you know, sometimes I don't really pay much attention to that intro, intro video and I'm working on a new one. I've been saying it for like six months. But so, on the other note, like sometimes I just digest all of that and it's like, wow, and it takes me back uh, to just how far I've come. Just even in the last two years, I... I I'm excited to bring Chris Knuckles Nylon in. He's been on the show before, but it was over two years ago when it was called Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. A lot has changed, but I'm super excited to get Knuckles in here. I don't want to take up any more time. I have lots to say at the end of the show. One quick promo from the beautiful people at Team Issued and one of my favorites, Regan Bartell, and we'll be right back with legendary Chris Knuckles Nyland. Hi there, it's Regan Bartell, the play-by-play voice of the Kelowna Rockets, Brady Leobold's biggest fan. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being a part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. Teamissued.ca, promo code TOEDRAG15 for 15% off. 
Shout out to Regan Bartel. I'm hoping that maybe this summer, which I don't know if it's going to happen, but I got to get back to the Kelowna Rockets Alumni Weekend, one of the best junior hockey organizations in the entire CHL. The Kelowna Rockets do an amazing job for their players, for their alumni. It's just such a beautiful city to play in with beautiful people. I can't wait to get back out to Kelowna. Hello to Regan. Hello to Jesse from Team Issued. Thank you for all your support. But Now let's get to the reason why you guys are all here. You get to hear me talk enough. I'm very, very excited uh, to get Chris Knuckles Nylon back on the show. I got a phone call about two weeks ago in the morning and I look at my phone and it says, Chris Knuckles Nylon. I haven't talked to him for a little bit. And I'm like, holy shit. I guess I best, I I guess I better answer this one. So I answered it and uh, talked about coming back on my show. And uh, of course he's got his show, which is fantastic. We're going to talk all about it. But this is a guy that I really look up to, you know, tons of success on the ice, Stanley Cup, over 3,000 minutes in penalties, an NHL all-star. But to me, his biggest accomplishment was taking his life back and saying no more. He lives a life of recovery and he's somebody that I look up to. So without further ado, originally from Boston, my man, Chris Knuckles, Nylon. Brady, how how you doing, pal? What's happening? Doing very well, man. It's uh, it's really nice to see you, and uh, it's really nice to see everything that's going on, man. Your presence on social media, Nux. Holy shit, you! I, I that's all the entertainment I need. Your stories, whether it's related to your playing days or just what's going on in your everyday life. You're getting injured. You're doing this. You just make well, me laugh, man. What um, what did you just say? You're doing this at 35 years old. I'm 64 <laughs> fucking years old, okay, and I'm doing this social media. 64 years old. I'm like, what am I doing? But you're killing. Uh, listen, you know, I you got to try and build up the following and get people to, you know, when you're promoting your own podcast, you got to do some things. Uh, you got to do that extra stuff. And listen, I enjoy doing it. It's fun. It, it's something I didn't think I'd be doing at this age. But, you know, having lost uh, my job in radio, um, I wanted to continue on and um, and try and make a living. And um, this is a good way to do it. Yeah. And uh, I, I know I, I really enjoy it, too. And I think a lot of people I think what a gift you you give to people by doing that, because you're, you're so good at what you do, Knuckles, and your stories. I'm not sure I've met anybody that has funnier and more uh, intricate stories that you just are unbelievable. So I'm so happy that you're well, doing thanks. it. And, and, and you're a co-host there with Tim Stapleton on the Raw Knuckles podcast. Tell me a little bit about how that came about and who Tim Stapleton is. Well, Stapes, uh, he played a little bit in the NHL, right? He um, was in Winnipeg, um, in Toronto for a cup of coffee. Uh, he, as Tim would say, he showered with the guys once. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then he played over in Russia. Um, That's right. And uh, American kid. And I, I met him at a, uh, in a, uh, a Zoom uh, conference that we had. And I ended up meeting him, got to know him a little bit. And... Um, Thought he was a funny kid. I saw him on spitting chicklets. And when I started, th- thought about starting my own thing, um, you know, I said, maybe I'll do it alongside someone else. See if I can get somebody I'm compatible with. Uh, someone a little younger, maybe reach out to a younger crowd, which Tim is. And a um, uh, funny kid, knowledgeable. And um, yeah, so that's how that came about the marriage of knuckles and tim stapleton <laughs> Stapes, funny guy yeah. um you know had a good little career i played with chelios he played with chelios which is incredible <laughs> i played with chelly you know chelly come in his first year i was already in montreal and then um those two played together in uh Chelly's last year when he was in Atlanta and he was still trying to hang in there and play incredible career yeah but just never wanted to hang him up Chelly's he'd still be playing if they didn't if they didn't say go home he'd still be playing <laughs> I have I made have, him go home I have no yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that's uh that's a, that's actually hilarious How, what's the age gap between you and Tim then like 20 something years oh Tim's uh, about 40 years old yeah so okay. 20 uh, yeah about 24 years uh, wow yeah, not to date, not to not to date Chris Jellios, but holy hell, he he did it. Seemed like he played in the league forever, but uh, he he was in a rem- remarkable shape to be able to do that. But yeah, um, where tell me a little bit like what uh, your podcast? What can people expect out of the Raw Knuckles podcast? I've seen it and I love it, but I just if you know what 
what do you what's the main kind of goal what are you guys talking about is it is it hockey today is it past stories is it a, a little bit of everything you know listen i i know listen chicklets is awesome and and they have a great crew they those guys they're funny and they 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 you know biz is funny and whitney gets going he's he, they're good together and the rare Admiral, they're awesome the best hockey podcast there is um now i i don't aspire to be like them i don't want to be like them i want to be unique be my own guy and along with tim i i guess what i'd like to do is maybe get into a little bit more of the some of some of the serious talk i guess you know guys growing up their relationship at home you know how they get to where they got um you know their story somewhat and yeah. you know and certainly having a different range of guests, you know, and um, obviously hockey is how I'm starting this thing. Do I want to expand? I'd love to expand. I'd love to be able to have, you know, people on from all walks of life at some point, but uh, I got to get that following to be able to do that. And hopefully um, no matter who the guest is, people uh, will come on and tune in. So we'll see, you know, it, it takes time to build as I'm sure, you know, um, and you know, we're into it now a couple months and, um, you know, we're, we're working our butts off. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's fun. It's fun from like, I'm a fan, right? So I sit back and I watch, I've listened to the show and I, I love the presence on social media, as I alluded to earlier. Um, uh, what you guys are doing is fantastic. And I just think people, like you said, it just takes time for people to get eyes on it. Uh, but no doubt it's, uh, it's going to be a tremendous success just while we're here. Um, I'm going to put it on the screen there, the Raw Knuckles podcast. Make sure you follow them on social media. I'll have it in all the links if you're listening on audio after uh, at the Raw Knuckles podcast on Instagram. And then to follow Chris as well, uh, Knuckles on social media is at Knuckles Nylon on Instagram. And uh, I'm telling you, do your do yourselves a favor and follow both those pages because it'll make your day a hell of a lot brighter. It has mine. So we'll 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 put that back up at the end of the show. And subscribe, follow and like, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's right subscribe yeah. follow, like uh -huh. tell your friends share it with your friends put it everywhere um let's get let's get into that a little bit i mean i think we talked about it two years ago when you were on my show uh, some about your story but let's get into some of your story about your childhood i think some people know uh, you grew up in the tough end of boston and and uh you always kind of had that chip on your shoulder um is that true yeah oh yeah for sure you know it, listen um I grew up, you know, my dad was a military man. He was uh, Special Forces, uh, uh, Green Beret. He certainly was a guy who instilled discipline in the household, for one. Two, he's a guy that taught me um, to, I, I guess, help me to navigate the streets of the city I grew up in. You know, everybody's always trying to get over on you. Um, you know, somebody's trying to get the edge on you. You know, someone's always getting tougher than you or bigger than you or not going to put you in your place. And, you know, he's one of them guys that uh, instilled that in me young uh, in a couple ways. He talked to me about it, but he also showed me. I saw him in certain situations where he just didn't take shit from anybody. Um, uh, uh, I saw him in a couple uh fights at different times in our lives i saw him um take my sister up the end of the street when some girls come by the house and a bunch of them start yelling at my sister scumming her out saying shit about her calling her a whore and this and that and when my sister was I, I gotta say my sister was 10th grade my father went upstairs said susan come on let's go get in the car and they drove up the street. I jumped in the car with my brother because there were some boys there, too. And just in case, uh, my brother and I had to step in. My father brought us along. And we caught up to them. Uh, my sister, my father said, you're getting out of the car. You're going to go up to that girl and kick the living shit out of her. She will not come by the house and ever disrespect you again. I guarantee you that. She got out of the car. My sister went up and ripped that girl's hair out of her head, kicked her ass all over the fucking neighborhood. And, <laughs> you know, I'm like, yes, I was psyched. I was a young kid, right? And, you know, I just saw that. My father instilled that in all of us. And, you know, um, 
You know, I like that. And I like the fact that my father would stand up for us and uh, be there for us. I, uh, My father, one night, uh, my sister Kim was born, stopped at uh, a place called Brigham's to get my mother a hot fudge sundae to bring up to the hospital after having my sister. And a couple guys come out of the, the Costello's, the, the bar on the corner, and, and had words of my father, called him four eyes. Well, my father put one of them right through the fucking window and knocked the other one out. And I like that. You know, you, you want to give me shit? You know, I I, I just, I, I was taught to stand up for myself and stand up. Also, my father taught me to stand up for people that, um, and, and instilled me in a, <laughs> at a young age, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Yes. Don't pick on kids because everybody else is doing it. Matter of fact, I would expect you to stick up for kids if someone else is picking on them. And if I ever get a call here from that school that that's what you're doing, he said, I'll kick your ass all around the neighborhood. So, yeah, he, I, you know, certainly instilled some fear in me. I was a kid that got in some trouble, and my father disciplined me also uh, in ways probably that today, you know, you probably get arrested for, for Christ's sake. But you know what? Listen, did I deserve that? Did I need that? When I look back at it, it's not the way I chose to do things. Not to say he didn't do things right. I mean, honestly, I don't think if not for my father, I mean, I would I would have been a whole different path. I would have never made it to the NHL. I'd probably end up in jail. Or I, I certainly, if, if not jail, I would have ended up in the military, which wouldn't have been such a bad thing. But I'm just wondering if they would have taken me uh, having a record. You know what I mean? So my father really... Um, he, he he was hot on me. He was tough on me. But, uh, God, I miss him every day. I love him. Um, you know, I was able to. We dealt with some stuff one-on-one. -on -one. I was able to put a lot of that stuff behind us. Um, you know, he's my hero. Always my dad. And, um, yeah, a lot of what you see here today came from him. There's no question about it. And my mom. Absolutely. There's no doubt in my mind. And, uh, yeah, I'm sorry for your loss. And uh, just to everyone out there, too, happy belated Father's Day to all the dads out there, my dad, and, and everyone whose dads have passed on. You know, it's, uh, it can be a tough day, but it, it's amazing to hear the memories and to be able to, uh, you know, come back and kind of have a greater understanding of, of how he really molded you to the, to the man you became. And I, you know, when I watch some of your, your clips from playing in the NHL, I mean, you had over 3,000 penalty minutes. It's no secret you were a banger, right? Like you, so they don't call you Knuckles Nyland for nothing. Um, mm. But what I see a lot of is you not fighting always for the sake of yourself. It was always sticking up for teammates and, and trying to set a tone for your team and putting yourself on the line for the greater sake of the team or somebody else. And that's sort of what I heard when you were saying that. Yeah, you know, but like I said, that started, a lot of that started, um, back at home growing up yeah. in the neighborhood i did hanging around the street corner sticking up for friends i did the same same thing for my friends or my teammates my mm -hmm. family members i i would always stick up for um my friends or teammates i was just i was brought up that way it's what i was taught to do it's uh, uh you know out of love out of loyalty and 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 that's what i did i didn't mind putting myself on the line uh for other people um you know my dad being a green beret um you know in um in in latin uh, they have a saying liber oppresso and it's it means free those that are oppressed and that was um uh, something that my dad kind of lived by and certainly instilled that in me and um as far as i guess my teammates and 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 certainly that role I learned at a young age watching the Bruins <laughs> growing up where I grew up. And and I I loved the way the Bruins played. I loved everything about the way they played the game of hockey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I loved the crash bang. I loved the drop in the gloves. I loved the all of it. Yeah. The scoring the goals, uh, team toughness, all that. And you know, growing up there and watching them, all of them years certainly rubbed off on me. And um you know, it, 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 you know, after minor hockey and then playing it in high school and then off in, in prep school for a year and then college, um, I was 
fortunate enough through, um, you know, a, a coach of mine who was friends with Doug Harvey and Dickie Moore to get drafted by the Canadians. I would have never got drafted by the Canadians if not for one person um, that coached me at a young age. It's really important. Eh? It's it. Sometimes it, it is to, to notice that it can be one person that can really give you that break or to really help push you through. Before we go any further, I have to say, I know you're from Boston. You're obviously a huge Bruins yeah. fan. You played for the Bruins too, as well. Uh, yeah. You would feel right at home where I'm sitting right now, not behind me, but in front of me. I'm actually in Harry Sinden's niece's basement right now. Wow. And yeah. And uh, his, his, uh, his nephew actually before the show came up to me and said, you got you got Chris Knuckles Nyland on your show tonight, and I said, mm -hmm. "Yeah." He goes, "I met him at the outdoor classic game. He mm -hmm. is the nicest guy I ever met." He comments mm -hmm. on the thing, so I, I have mm -hmm. to say, Jason. Jason said that to me before the show. He well, got hello to Jason. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's Harry Sinden's nephew. But I mean, the Bruins. There's Bruins stuff everywhere, and I say it almost every show. I'm from Vancouver, and all I can see is Vancouver getting torched in 2011 after we lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember it all too well. <laughs> no mm -hmm. kidding. No kidding, right? Um, we could talk a little bit about your career, um, maybe uh, down down the line here in a bit, but I really want to get into kind of the meat of things. Um, you're really open. Uh, you were, uh, to me, one of the first that really I saw who became really vulnerable. I mean, yes, Theo and, and Sheldon Kennedy came out with some stuff, but when it came to the, the, the drug addiction, uh, and the word heroin, especially, um, that was something that was new to me, having been a heroin addict at the time when I saw it, um, just never, never thinking that another hockey player could get there. And today I now know that just in 2021 alone, we lost just in the hockey community, ranging from minor hockey players up to professional, to just to my knowledge, 14 hockey players died of fentanyl overdose in 2021 alone. So incredible. Yeah, I, it, that I didn't know. I didn't know that stat. That's incredible. Yeah, I, it's uh, it's an it's obviously an epidemic, and um, it, it's really sad uh, what's going on out there. Um, but I want to yeah. ask. I kind of want to ask you about your your journey into that world, coming out of the NHL, and 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 where did that start for you? Was it alcohol, pain pills? How does how does Chris Knuckles Nyland get to the essentially rock bottom? Yeah, well, I, listen, I, I just think it's it has to do with, I think, uh, you know, when we look at addiction, alcoholism, whatever, it, it encompasses our whole life. It's not in any one part. Okay. Yeah. I, a lot of people point to guys who fought, they get screwed mm -hmm. up and uh, they, you know, they end up in trouble. Um, they try and point to one thing and, and you just can't, because when you look at addiction and alcoholism, it, it, it's a progressive disease, obviously, but it starts somewhere. And usually it starts back in your childhood somewhere. Yeah. When you look at addiction, alcoholism, certainly see uh, a lot of people um, from my own experiences and being around it and been to treatment a couple of times and working with a lot of people, people often suffer through some childhood trauma or something that happens in their lives at a young age uh, that they don't understand they don't make sense of um they start drinking at an early age it usually starts with drinking it's not drugs right away usually the first thing we do is drink and then um you know it goes from there and then you start experimenting with a pot whatever and me uh when i look at my uh, hockey career my hockey life alcohol was a big part of it all the way through from when I was a kid to my NHL days. You know, I never drank in the locker room when I played in Montreal because they didn't have all alcohol in the locker room, which I thought was a good thing. Thing. The only time we drank in that locker room was after we won the Stanley Cup. That was it. Hmm. And, and that I was, I was glad I, I went to New York when I got traded it's weird. I got in the locker room out and everybody got beers after the first game and they're drinking. I could never drink right after a game. I had to go to the restaurant, chill for a bit and, you know, drink water, hydrate. And then I would drink and I would drink a lot. Now, a lot of nights, you know, back as a kid after hockey, that's what we did, right? After hockey as a kid, drink beers, everybody, hey, party, smoke a couple bones, whatever. 
And and then you, you know, off to college, same thing in college. After every game, we're at the college bar, whooping it up. And, you know, it kind of went hand in hand. It was part of the culture, especially back in 60s, 70s, 80s. That was the, the culture in the NHL. And then we, you know, we, we, we go to post-career. And my drinking really never changed. Uh, when my career was over, I drank like I was still playing hockey. And, um, you know, over the course of my career, I had quite a few injuries. I had quite a few surgeries and I had a lot of surgeries after I retired and um, started with Percocet. Um, you know, Percocet turned into at one point Oxycontin and then Oxycontin to eventually uh, to heroin because of uh, being so desperate, being so worried about being sick and the joint pain and the sweats and the, the diarrhea and the uh, yeah. the misery of withdrawing there's nothing, from opiates. There's, there's no, not, there's there's no not, worse feeling. <laughs> there's nothing even close. There's nothing in the realm of opiate withdrawal. And you and I have both experienced uh, probably a, I, more times than I care to remember. But uh, it is sheer, you know, misery, sheer misery. And you do anything not to have that come on you, right? And I, and I think what a lot of people don't understand, why don't you just stop? Well, yeah. it, it, you know, it, it's not so easy just to stop. I mean, like people that are alcoholics, it's not just stop drinking. Okay, I'll stop for five days. Then I start drinking again. When I know when I start drinking, like I don't drink so much because I love the taste of alcohol. I love the effect. I drank for the effect. Yeah. You know, after game, a couple fights, I'm all beat up. Three games or four nights, I'm all beat up. Man, I want to relax. What better way to relax than alcohol? I didn't take drugs when I played. I, You know, the odd time in the summer, I'd be out home in Boston. I might have sn snorted a line of coke here and there out at the bar with friends. But during the season, I never did any of that. One time I took pills during my NHL career was when I broke my arm. I was playing for the Rangers. I broke my arm in Montreal, and I took Percocet on the way home uh, on the plane because I did not have a cast on. They couldn't cast me because I was flying, and they gave me Percocet. I got to um, New York as soon as the plane landed. I got off the plane. I saw it puke in my brain. Though. I was sick from it. Yeah. And then eventually in retirement, you know, the drinking kept going, and then the surgeries came, and the Percocet came, and next thing I'm – I, I'm taking, you know, two every four hours, then pretty soon four every four hours, then pretty soon six every four hours. Then I'm like just taking them because if I don't take these things, I don't feel right. Yeah. Um, I don't, not so much. Uh, if I don't take these things, I'm not going to be high. It got to the point where you just take those pills or those Percocet those oxycotton or that heroin just so you feel okay just so you can get out of bed yeah just so you feel okay you're not high you're not you are just okay yep. and uh anything uh, to keep from getting sick and that i ended up on that hamster wheel uh and you know it's it you know it's it's misery um, I didn't know how to get out of it. I knew nothing about treatment. I didn't know anything about AA or NA or none of that. I knew nothing about that. And um, I was out there and uh, the overdose is uh, not good. You know, I heard you say the number of times you overdosed. Um, I overdosed three times. The last time, if I was not in a hospital, when it happened, I wouldn't be here. If I was out sitting in my car, it would have been all over. And uh, I was, <laughs> for some strange reason, I'm still here. But, um, yeah, that, uh, you know, p a lot of people don't understand addiction. Uh, I've, I've certainly lived it. You've lived it. And um, I, I, there's not many people in this world that are not affected by it somehow. It Thank is a family you. disease. And, it, and yes. if, if yeah. people say they haven't, <laughs> oh, it's, you know everybody's been affected by this. And when you talk about a pandemic, they could give a rat's ass about that pandemic. You know, they, they're more worried about the other one, yeah. uh, the flu, than yeah. they're worried about everybody dying 
Yeah. Like you said, 14 hockey players. But the number of people that die from fentanyl overdose every day in the U.S. and Canada, it, it, it's ridiculous. And now, again, where is it? It's all coming out of China, coming through Mexico. And all these pills they're making look exactly like the real thing. And um, our country just continues to leave a southern border open, wide open, so all the drugs can just flow in freely. Um, don't even make it difficult on there. Uh, and and it, it, it's a sad state of affairs the world is in right now, and it's, uh, it's not good. Not you and I well. very much have the same views on on the flu and and everything, and I you know and and you know I think it's uh you know I'm not going to talk about why you're not working that radio show anymore, but I wouldn't be working that radio show either. So, um, uh, well, they fired me because I'm not vaccinated. But that's the bottom line. They fired me. They wanted me vaccinated. I I didn't want to get vaccinated for health reasons, um, and uh, I didn't, and I wasn't going to keep. A job uh, over risking my life. I I finally got my life where I want it. I got all the shit out of my life. Uh, I got sober. I feel good. And I'm I'm as happy as I've been in my life, honestly. And uh, I did not want to risk uh, taking that experimental drug. Um, yeah, yeah. One that uh, certainly I don't believe in. And um, I don't think I should have to take, especially I have natural immunity which is proven to be a lot better than the shit they were giving out to everybody yeah absolutely um got a couple of comments in here uh i just want to get to one from Stuart smith right now that says hey chris thanks for sharing your story i grew up watching doug wickenheiser play for the regina mm -hmm. Pats. do you think it was tough for him in montreal to be taken first overall ahead of denny savard oh my god i love doug wickenheiser Doug and I were very good friends when he came here. I came in 79. I was here a year, and then Doug got drafted. They, and I'll, I'll never forget it. They, Everybody talked about Doug being the next Jean Beliveau because Wick was a big sentiment, great hand, smooth. And, um, you know, certainly here in Quebec, everybody wanted uh, the good Chenu. They wanted Denny Savard. And when Wick got here, boy. Um, you know, he was thrust right into the lineup. Um, uh, things didn't go well, a lot of pressure. There was a lot of negative media on him and the pressure grew and it built. He just he had a tough time to deal with it. He didn't have a great support system. I mean, he did. His teammates cared about him and tried to, tried to be there for him. And it, he went through hell here. And I was so happy when he, he ended up, going to St. Louis because he, he was freed up of all that, you know, we should have picked Denny Savard. We should have picked Denny Savard. It was done. Um, it, it was actually really sad uh, what he went through here. Uh, like I said, I loved Wick and God rest his soul. Uh, terrible uh, what happened to him. But uh, yeah, I miss Doug. I, I'd love to been able to see Wick today, actually. And it's uh, sad that I can't. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing that story. And uh, just to answer Stuart's question, it's great uh, to be able to hear that. But yeah, it's a very sad story. But I remember my I, I never got to, to see him play by any means, but playing in the Western Hockey League going into Regina, it was Doug Wickenheiser was like this myth. Uh, and mm -hmm. looking at his records from junior and his scoring, and I'm like, how does anybody get that many points in any league? Like, it just didn't even make sense to me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm probably never going to make the NHL if this is what I got to accomplish at 16. That's what I'm thinking. Um, I want to kind of get back into what we were talking about earlier um, with the recovery. So, tell tell me if you tell me a little bit like when it started for you. I know you mentioned taking the Percocet coming off the plane, um, and you said you, it's interesting because you said that you threw up. And I had the same experience the very first time I did, but I, I didn't start with Percocets. I went straight to Oxys. And I remember I, uh, I took one and I, and I remember throwing up and I've shared this on the show before because my, it was basically like my body's rejecting it, but, yeah. I'm, I'm, but I'm now high and yeah. I'm throwing up. And as I'm throwing up, I, I, I know I'm throwing up and I know this is uncomfortable, but at the time I was like, wow, this is the best I've ever felt in my life. Like it just, even though I was throwing up, I knew I was in trouble. I, I really knew I was in trouble. I was 20, 
one or 22 years old and at the beginning of my pro hockey career and it was like i i knew i was in trouble and you mentioned the past traumas and stuff um that's usually what we can take it back to is and it doesn't have to be some sort of uh you know for me i was sexually abused but that doesn't always have to be the case just because it looks no. maybe worse to somebody else it's all perspective and what somebody else goes through right and that's yeah. something that i like to hammer home to people but when like surgeries after retirement like how long after retirement did you start to dabble in this and then when did you foresee this becoming a problem and then once it was a problem was this something that you were like how the hell do i get out of this i got to do it on my own you mentioned you didn't know about treatment was it like fuck i gotta fight my way out of this on my own too yeah you know i like i said i didn't know anything about it but uh as far as the percocet it pro probably i got going probably around 95 few surgeries then i got going on the percocet and i remember um after surgery having them and you know it was the first time when i ran out i went to find more i went to the doctor and said listen i got this going on that going on and i needed more pills and i got going on them um and then i started getting them on the street yeah and uh it was right around it was probably about a year before um oxycontin came out so this is right, right around 95 96 it came out uh the oxycontin and um you know that oxycontin they said is <laughs> yeah non-addictive you know oh uh, man you know um that scumbag family uh For you. Who, the, the sackler family yeah. who who preyed on uh uh these vulnerable people and lied uh to everybody doctors everybody they lied to uh, the politicians everybody and they come out with this wonder drug apparently well um it was so addictive um and and i, I can't say much more addictive than percocet it was the same thing as any opiate uh, once that gets in your system and your body becomes physically addicted to it you're done this, it gets the claws in you and you can't get the claws out. So I got going, you know, I, I remember probably the, the most Percocet I took in a day was probably 60. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and the sickness of that. And uh, then when Oxycontin came along, I'm thinking, wow. Um, okay. I, I'm, if I can take this Oxycontin now without having to take these Percocet with all the aspirin or Tylenol in them, then geez, it's actually healthier for me because it's all the opiate and I'm not taking all that, the aspirin and, and the other stuff that they put in Percodan or per Percocet. So I thought that's how sick I was at that point. I thought it was healthier for me to take the Oxycontin. Plus it was not addictive. So I got going on those things and, you know, it's just out of control in no time, you know, it went from, you know, taking one to two to up to, you know, 10 a day, like crazy, 80, milli 80 milligram tablets, insanity. Yeah. Yeah. And then snorting them and then going snorting and snorting them, snorting them. And then, you know, that progression of um, with the drug, when they get to the point, certainly where um, the government uh, was starting to step in because all these people were starting to get addicted to it. They were trying to do some. Then they put a coating on it so you couldn't take the coating off and all those things. And 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 what we do to stay in our addiction is incredible. But, but you know, I was I was a sick man. Um, you know, I was I was so desperate to get those things when I was out of them. I it's not like I. There's not much I would do not to get them. You know, I I went to different doctors. Um, you know, I I when I look back now, I you know, I was ashamed of what I did, but mm -hmm. I've certainly forgiven myself over the course of that. But you know, I felt terrible. I, I I had doctors everywhere, and I had to do that to keep up with uh, the demand of my addiction. And uh, I, I didn't think there was any way out. I didn't know how I could get out of this. Um, I had no clue until um, somebody um, somebody got my attention. Somebody got your attention. Sometimes that's all it takes, right? And yeah. Well, it was a former teammate um, who, um, not, I'll say his name, Bob Gain. He was my captain. And, you know, we would talk once in a while. He knew I was struggling 
you know, he kind of knew something was going on, the drinking, the why he didn't know, but he knew things uh, were difficult. And he gave me a card um, from somebody in the NHL. And it happened to be Dan Cronin, who uh, is the inter lead interventionist for the NHL. And Dan had come out to meet me in um, in Boston one day. And what, what talked, year is this, Knuckles? Uh, that was uh, right around 2000. Okay. Like right, not late 99 or er, no early 2000 March. And cause it was St. Patrick's day. And, um, yeah, Dan, um, he, um, came and met with me and, uh, you know, we talked and he, he could tell, you know, obviously it, I didn't realize I was talking to a heroin addict, uh, a guy who, uh, had suffered from this disease for so long and had been sober for so long. Wow. And, you know, he's asking me what I, what do I do to deal with some of the injuries I had over the course of my career? And I said, Oh, now and again, I take a Percocet here and there, but not, not a lot. Meanwhile, like, you know, you know, I'm lying through my teeth. I don't want to tell him I'm snorting 10 eighties a day. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just out of hand. And anyway, Dan had, kind of realized he didn't think he was gonna get to me but he asked me if i meet with a therapist south of boston down in a town called duxbury uh with this woman uh dr aikida and dr aikida i met with uh three times the third time i was i was uh a chocolate mess on the floor bawling crying and uh i was on a plane the next day to to uh treatment for the first time back in 2000 i flew to california with the treatment center and um i learned how to at least i got introduced to how to live a life without drugs and alcohol but um yeah i got introduced to it it lasted about three years uh, not even just under three years and uh i didn't think i was an alcoholic um i knew i was a drug addict but i didn't think i was an alcoholic and i started drinking again and it took me back to the drugs to where i didn't want to go yeah and one thing led to another worse. and and did it get worse oh yeah it got worse yeah oh, it never gets God. better <laughs> yeah it never gets better and you know i ended up uh in a bad way um boxy cotton out of just crazy and then uh eventually uh snorting the heroin and then i went to treatment once again and relapsed not long after i was out and ended up on heroin once again um this what, time in what, year, now? what, what this year are we in now? 20 uh, uh 20 uh, i went to treatment in 09 and i get out and i relapsed probably about seven months later and um I got sober again in March, April, May, um, May of 2011. Um, and then, and then I was good for a while. And I relapsed one evening when my mother had a stroke in mm -hmm. 2015 and i almost bit it and um i've been sober since uh my um sobriety date is uh, december 7th 2015. that's amazing and uh there's Su susan cook uh is watching there's a few comments but she says thank you chris for being so authentic and real and uh, i'll just echo those words man because it's uh sometimes not easy to talk about uh you know i i certainly understand because you and i went through a lot of the same stuff as far as the drug side of stuff so it, it resonates with me huge but you mentioned something earlier that i wanted to point out to people watching or listening is that when the government tried to step in and do something about these oxys and i'm kind of curious I, I think that's where you're leading to but that was the same for me as i was doing 10 to 15 80s a day like minimum if i didn't have that i was like in yeah. six yeah. you know how it is yeah. then all of a sudden they came out with i'm not sure what it was in the states but here in canada they called them the oxy neos which you could no longer crush up you could no longer do all that kind of stuff 
And what all that did was create a heroin pandemic. And that was why I switched to heroin. Uh, and up until that point, I thought that I was on a different level than heroin addicts. I was fully addicted to oxys. And I'd have people that few people that knew that would be like, you know, that's just synthetic heroin. And I'm like, go oh, fuck off. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. This is this is prescription, whether I'm getting it. I did have a prescription for a while, but also doctor hopping like you until finally the doctors are like, yo, you're a drug addict and we're not giving yeah. it to you anymore. And then yeah. to the street. <laughs> But I'll tell you that day that uh, I used to go see this guy to get pills on the street. And every time I was going to see him, he was he was using heroin and I would just look and he would offer it to me. And I'm like, yeah, right, man. Like, there's uh, no way in hell I'm ever going to no, do it. Ooh, that bad stuff. Yeah. Right. Until one day I went it's to all the same. <laughs> right? It is all the same. But this is my the same, but yeah, I get at you. the time, my mentality. Yeah. Right. But I, and I, I thought I was above it, right? And I'm never going to go there. And on that particular day, this guy, he's like, hey, man, because it was right when they were switching the, and the pills were getting harder to find. And he's like, I'm not going to have any pills till like tomorrow, man. And he's sitting there using this heroin. And I was sick, right? Like sick. And he's like, he, had a, he was this guy from Turkey. He had this accent. He's like, you know, if you just smoke a little bit of this, everything will be fine. I'm like, fucking give it to me, man. And uh, I, I, I still remember that day. And I was just back home and visiting my dad. Uh, and some family and me and my dad were driving around and I hadn't seen him in five years and he'd seen me in jail and on homeless and all this stuff. And uh, now we have a great relationship, but I was pointing out to things in our hometown, like there's the first place I did heroin and this and that and whatever. And I could just <laughs> go back there. But on that specific, oh. on that specific day, Knuckles, like yeah. if that guy had a pile of dog shit and that was going to make me feel better, yeah, I'm, I'm, eating it. <laughs> I'm eating it. I'm smoking it. I'm snorting whatever I got to do. To not feel that it's funny, way. People don't get that, right? They don't yeah. get that. It can't, they can't even comprehend that. To me, that it just sounds normal. Yeah. Because I, I would have done the same thing. Anything not to have that, that wretched, terrifying, awful, awful yeah. feeling come, come over your body uh, and take control of you. It, it's the, it, it's the worst ever. And I'm so glad I'm free from that. And I'm not that slave to yeah. the drugs anymore. And um, that's what I was. I was a slave to it all like you were. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it is the most hopeless, helpless feeling. And when you keep trying like you did and I did in treatment and you get a little bit of clean time or even in some cases almost three years. And then all of a sudden it's like you're right back in. You're like, what? like how? Like I'm never. It feels like you're just stuck like that forever. But here you are. How long have you been sober? Well, I'll be if I make it to December seventh, I will be seven years. So, but the longest time I've had in the last twenty-two years, I tried started to get sober back in two thousand. So I've had stints, right? But this is the longest stint right now, and um, yeah, I, I just um, you know it never gets better, and I'm yeah. gonna say it here that yes, I'm not going back that way, but. Um, it is one day at a time and that's how I got to treat it. That's how I got to take it. I have to do the things on a daily basis I do to keep my sobriety where it is right now, uh, keep my life where it is right now and, and have the happy life that I do. You say you with your dad, my dad was never more proud of me than, uh, uh, when I got sober or happier, uh, in my life. And our relationship was in incredible. Um, and God rest his soul. He got to see me sober. Uh, he died back in, um, in, um, November 30th, December 1st of last year. So, um, yeah, it, um, yeah, it was difficult on me, but, uh, I, God rest his soul. He, he was such a good man. And, um, yeah, the values, uh, the character he had, uh, you know, um, God, yeah, I, I like to think a lot of it has worn up, you know, rubbed off on me, uh, for sure. And it has, no but, you know, I certainly stumbled in my life and, um, and I've gone down, but I've gotten back up every time. And, um, I don't want to, I don't have to keep getting up. I will, but I don't want to, I want to stop stumbling. I've stumbled enough. Uh, yeah. I hear you. I hear you on that one. I don't know how many times I can pick myself back up again. And I'm the same as you. I, I say I'm never going back there. 
But at the same time, it's one of those things that we have to be vigilant of, right? And every person is different. Um, you know, it, it, was there something different this time for you, uh, this time around that that was like, hey, that clicked differently? Were you maybe more willing to to do some of the work and work through some of the shit that you had to work through this time around? Or what's been the secret? I worked through that stuff before, but what, what happened? Uh, I, you know what? I went home. My mother had a stroke. She's in the hospital. I thought she was dying. I got weak. I didn't call um, the person I should have called. I called someone else. Yeah. And um, I thought it um, would help me get through that that miserable time of possibly losing my mom in that painful time and um what it did is almost kill me i mean that was the one um that it, like i said if i if i didn't do that in the bathroom in the hospital and then walk into the room where my mother was laying there after having a stroke and my niece not being in that room with my dad if i had went out to the car and done i would have been in the car and i would have never made it out of the car and I would have, I would have made it out of the car into the grave is where I would have ended up. But my niece uh, was alert enough to run down and get the nurse. There was something going on. She thought with me, and I, I don't remember. I woke up in the emergency room, and um, I was brought back to life. Uh, they hit me with a knock in, and it's uh, it's unfortunate today that so many kids think they're taking this pill or that pill and it's loaded with fentanyl and they're dying left and right. And you know it as well as I do. And um, <laughs> it's just crazy. Our country doesn't, um, they don't do enough um, to try and help, help these kids that are addicts. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it, they just, it does. It, they all say they'll do something, but then they don't. You know, it's the same with politicians. Anytime the government says they're going to do something for you, they care about the people. They're so full of shit. They never do anything. They don't care about the people. They care also, about themselves. Yeah, to me, it's a it's it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, they everything. care about enriching themselves and their position and make sure I get reelected. And that's a, that's all they give a shit about. They don't give a shit about the people. I know. And. It's sad, uh, you know, that overdoses now claim more lives than than automobile accidents, every, yeah. right? So crazy, and, and and it's it's interesting because, you know, it like I'll just share a quick story like, because it is it's everywhere. And I say the same thing you said earlier. I go up to people because I share whenever I'm out. I'm talk. I have puck support, and I'm talking about puck support, and I'm talking about this stuff. I'm trying to create conversations about mental health and addiction, and I'm really open about my story because I mean I have nothing to hide. It's all out there anyways. And by talking, hopefully I can help somebody. I was at a rink the other day. I'm not going to say where because I don't want to you know put it out there. But this private rink uh, somewhere here in Ontario, and I met the one owner who's a, who's a guy, and and he was there, and I was doing some skills training, and then I left, and the first day I met him, and then I got a message from him, and said, "Hey, my business partner really wants to meet you, and uh, she's an older lady, she wants to talk to you." And I said, "Oh, that's great. I'm thinking maybe she wants me to come down and do some skills coaching and and everything else." Come to find out, her daughter passed away of an overdose five years ago, right? And like the owner of this hockey rink, and it, you know, it's. It's everywhere. Like I go to people and I say, if you can tell me whether you or somebody else, you know, that doesn't know somebody who has been affected by mental illness, illness or addiction or both, because oftentimes they go hand in hand, please tell me because I'm, I've yet to find one there. They, it doesn't exist. So why is it that more isn't being done? I'm not sure what the answer is exactly, but I, I found, and I, in, and maybe you can jump in here too. I found that the best healing for me and the, the healing where I've seen people get healed, it happens in community, like people helping people. Like instead of looking to these, these government officials, like we know, I, I'm in agreement with everything you said about them. It's like, instead of looking to them to do something, it's time for the people to start taking care of their neighbors and their communities. And like, that's where the, the real difference is going to be made. Do you think yeah. that's true? I, I listen the community i'm in to stay sober is awesome and it, it helps me and i show up and suit up every day um what i will say as far as um uh, <laughs> our world today um that we're so divided uh, as yeah. a people 
Uh, I don't care. You can say, oh, we're not. It's not as bad as you. It's bad. You know, there's people think a certain way on the right, and there's people that think a certain way on the left. And and there's just such division, especially in our country, south of the border, uh, in the U.S. Um, nothing ever gets done. They act like a bunch of, you know, babies. They, they they bitch and moan at each other. That's all they do. They didn't. They, they never t- take care of anything that they say they're going to take care of. It's just, and and all the while they enrich themselves, and it just, you know was split in half, you know, and, and you're right about it. Uh, and anytime I've been at treatment center, the two times I've gone, uh, I found that community very healing and, and, uh, and, and loving and caring. And if <laughs> the outside was a little bit more like it was on the inside of one of those places, um, you know, the world would be a better place. And here's a lot of people who, who yeah, they're trying to get well. They're, they've been sick uh, from drugs or alcohol, and they're trying to get well. And they're in that community. And, um, yeah, it's not real life in there. It's trying to get your life back together. But the true test comes is when you walk out those doors and life comes at you. And you have to live life on life's terms and stuff starts coming at you, how do you keep that sense of community? And there is a place to be able to do that for people who suffer from addiction and alcoholism. There is a place for that. So if you get plugged in and um, you make sure um, you're, you're doing the things that you were taught to do in that treatment center, then then you can live a productive and happy life on the outside without drugs and alcohol. And like I said, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. I just am. I, the, you know, the, the old, older you get, certainly um, you, your eyes start to open a little bit wider than they were when uh, you were younger. And you, you see a whole lot more uh, of what the world is really about and what, life is all it really about and that's family um loved ones and <laughs> and your dogs. friends the close friends you have and your doggies <laughs> and your and dogs. Your doggies <laughs> that's god, I lo- oh god i'm a dog um let me see if i can uh, let me see if i can show my adele there i don't think i can is there's her head there my saint bernard <laughs> oh yeah on the floor there i can i can't pull this computer up any further i'll pull the plug out anyway yeah she's right next to me all the time that little girl 140 pounds <laughs> i love her just a big ball of fur and love um god and then uh, my other one my golden Bodie. Um, um he's been with me um since you got clean right yeah and and just like helped me in so many ways you know when you first get sober like when i did i'm sure you had to deal with some of those anger issues you know a lot of a lot of stuff and that dog was like a service dog to me was by my side you know really uh really um i anytime i came i mean if i was watching a hockey game and i yelled like he would come over to me and like give me this look like calm down calm down and you know him along with Jamie, my significant yeah. other, the yeah. love of my life. Um, yeah, they've helped me, um, you know, become a better person and, and, and get rid of some of those character defects that I had that uh, they just don't work for me. Uh, back in the day, playing hockey, some of those <laughs> character defects might have been assets, but they don't work anymore. <laughs> Very, very much so. Um, yeah, j- just hello to Jamie too, because she uh, she helped coordinate the first time you came on my show. She was yep. super, super kind. Uh, I think probably gave you the elbow and been like, "Hey, just go on this kid's show. He looks like yeah. hell, and he's in recovery, and just go do it." And whatever. <laughs> but she is very um, 
She's very good like that. There's no yeah. question about it. Yeah, she was. Uh, she she was very very kind and uh, and as were you for coming on the show because I don't know how much you remember about two years ago when I started this. I had like no, I remember I spoke with you. Yeah. I had when no I was hockey to I, heroin. I had no no yeah. teeth. Like now, at least I have fake teeth I can put back in my mouth, right? I and but I, I was skinny. <laughs> Man, I look like hell. I go back and, and listen and watch. I'm like, man, good for you for even trying to do that because that that was rough. Isn't know? it pretty scary, though, um, when you do look back at where you were? And I see pictures of myself when I come in and how, you know, I when you're in it, you don't see it. But everybody <laughs> else does. You just think every, you think everybody thinks, you. oh, geez, you're keeping in pretty good shape. You know, you're not putting weight on. Oh, yeah, I'm not putting weight on. <laughs> I haven't eaten for two eat. weeks. I haven't, yeah, I haven't eaten for two weeks. But. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, it's crazy uh, how sick we get, you know, and, and and that's the mental health part of it. You know, yeah, you're physically addicted, but, boy, um, you, mentally, you just, you're not, you just refuse to see things and, it's really hard unless you have uh, that extended hand there and someone's willing to um, kind of show you the way. And that's that's the only way I was able to find this program is somebody somebody showed me the way. I, I would have never found it. And you, a lot of people don't. They end up dead, you know. And listen, we hear all the stats, you know, you know, 2% of the people go to treatment the first time, make it and stay sober but i know one thing even though i didn't stay sober after that first one i learned so much in that place and i knew i knew even when i went back out there that i knew what i should have been doing yeah and i eventually went back to it and did it and that's the thing you know even <laughs> so, so many people uh, when we talk about going to treatment center, a lot of people, it, it, they don't get it the first time. Um, you know, they just don't. It's it's not as easy as it can be explained to you. It's it's a program of action, and you have to get into action. And if you don't couple that with the knowledge of what you're supposed to do, uh, um, you can you can falter. And I, God knows, I did that, and yeah. you've done it. Um, my my dad, you know what my dad said to me, Knuckles, the first time he dropped me off at treatment? I'll never forget it. He goes, well, I've done a little bit of research, and apparently it takes seven times for someone to go to, re <laughs> to rehab before they get clean. So good luck. Give them hell. He said. <laughs> like, Thanks, Dad, right? Oh, God sure, bless him. Sure as shit. That's about, that's about what it took. So that my dad was always right. I should have just listened to him from day one. Maybe I'll start listening to him at 35. So. Um, I want to get to a couple questions, Knuckles. I don't want to take Go up right ahead. your time here. There's uh, some comments. Um, where are we going? Uh, I want to say hi to Lincoln too, my little guy. If he's still watching, if he's not sleeping, he uh, the comment there saying hi to dad. Hello, Lincoln. Uh, hi, Lincoln. <laughs> oh, he's such a sweet little boy. Uh, Matthew Means are watching all the way down in uh, Ushuaia, Argentina, which is like the southernmost part of the world before you wow. go. Antarctica. Yeah. And he makes, get this, this guy, he's been on my show. I brought him on my show because his story is so incredible. He, uh, he's from Buffalo, New York. He moved down there and he's growing the game of hockey. He's got a hockey stick company that he makes wooden hockey sticks for the community out of a, a, um, a tree that only grows down there that is actually perfect for wooden hockey sticks. So then that way the community can now play hockey. He's bringing in gear, doing amazing stuff. So hello to Matthew. Wow, way to go, Matthew. They got yeah. ice down there? Really? Argentina? They got ice. Uh, they uh, they have ice now, I believe, and summer when we have winter is. Uh, yeah, I really, yeah. You got to see where he is. It's beautiful. Like they yeah. outdoor this pot, this lay. Oh, it's just absolutely stunning. I know. I thought the same thing. I was like, what? Like uh -huh. um, Brody Kerbison says, following talking about your podcast. Way to go, Brody. Uh, yeah. Thank uh, you. Let's. Uh, it's, gonna, it's it's hard to do this one man show. Uh. Freedom Dagger says, Chris is a smart man. He also says, I can finally fly again now that they don't like healthy, unvaxxed people. Yeah. <laughs> David Carlson says, good for you, Chris. Be true to yourself. Dean Smeal, little brother to Stan Smeal, says, yeah. great to see two scrappers sit and open up about their lives. Proud of you both, as I know how tough it is. Hello, Say hi Dean. to Stan. 
uh, Dean, uh, one one tough bastard. Uh, he's got one more. He says, speaking about tough, who was the toughest guy you played against? Oh, God. The, yeah, yeah. You know, I know people you know, ask me that question. Because they're all tough. Yeah, they are. And that's how I answer it. And honestly, it, it, say tough at guys I played against. There's so many. Like, O'Reilly was tough. Uh, this guy's tough. Dave Brown's tough. That, you know, Semenko was tough. These guys, the guys who did that job, and you know you did it, um, they're a special breed, and, um, and they're all tough. I never – you know, put one guy above another guy. I always said, listen, I gotta, I gotta take every one of these guys serious and, and never let my guy down thinking, Oh, this guy ain't that tough. This guy's tougher than him. No, the right. I treated them all the same. And uh, I had to, now I knew if a guy's righty or lefty, I knew all that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of tough guys out there. Yeah, and, and and that's the thing to do that job. Anyone that did that job in my books is tough. Whether you get your ass handed to you in front of twenty thousand people or not, you're there and you're showing up, right? But we always associated toughness with that part. But you know, I'll tell you, I had a teammate, Matt Snazlin. Yeah. And and tough to me is that little bugger who could skate like the wind and would get slashed and hacked and cross checked. And yeah, I'd stick up for him. I'm, other guys would too, but he still played the game. He still went in the corner for the puck. He still drove wide on defensemen, knowing that some big idiot in Boston is going to slash him and try and break his arm because you could do that shit back in the day. They didn't, you didn't get a penalty. You'd be lucky if you got a penalty. Matt Snazlin was a tough little bastard. He's one, honestly, and, and so it's not always just the fighters. There's a lot of guys that play that game that, um, you know, they're not the biggest guys, but they they play a big game and, and like dean's brother stan was that way he's a tough bastard he played hard you know got hit got slashed got whacked scored goals uh tough guy yeah it was a, it was a much different game I, there's a few more i want to get to these questions but i got one Where where's your stance with hockey today like do you like the game um yeah you know i, I used to have a coach Claude while i loved him god rest his soul he'd say yankee boy the game don't change. Well, the game has changed, you know. Claude, God rest his soul. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I I like Bobby Orr. Um, some of the things Bobby Orr says, I always admire him as, as a hockey player and a human being. Um, but he, Bobby Orr says, put the red line back in. He yeah. said, what I like to see is a team come up the ice together and have to pass their way up the ice and find their way up to the other zone instead of that one long pass, you chip it in, chase it, or it's so wide open now. And and that's fine. They want speed. I get it. They want all that. I see guys now, they get clean hits. They got to pay for it, right? The guy gets hit clean, and the, the teammate wants to go sit. And honestly, the fighting part, it's bad enough fighting a guy with a helmet on because you're going to hit the helmet now and again. But with the visor, I just, I, I think it's stupid. I yeah. think it's stupid when I look at it now, honestly. And I did it for so long, but I look at it. It's like there's no purpose for it in the game anymore. But I don't know. I, I just, you know, the, it has changed somewhat. The, the, I think the way players come in now, I mean, they had control of us back in the day, right? It's a little different now. I think, uh, you know, the coaches, you know, they told you to do something you fucking did. And you didn't say, hey, hey why? Or show me, you know, show me. Uh, none of this. Say, I'll show you. I'll show you the fucking door. You're on the way to the American Hockey League. I'll fucking show you. But now it just seems today, you know, they get that, that fucking um, – iPad. I if I was ever coaching, oh. I'd fling that fucking thing so far across the ice. Why do they have those? No. You what? know, I I love what Kreider did to Zabanajad. Yeah, I love that too. I, love I loved that. it, and and these two guys, I, I really like that because I saw Kreider afterwards talking about Zabanajad, and he was in tears at the end of the playoff. He was talking about how that committed that guy is and what a player he is, and it, it was really emotional, but. He did that in a game, which I really like that. But I like to see the fucking coach do it. 
and not yeah. another player have to do it. If I was coaching, I wouldn't want him on the bench. I'd say, listen, here's the deal. You know what you did out in that fucking shift? You know, did you fuck up and you're not sure if you've, well, you come in between periods and I'll show you what you did wrong. Yeah. Okay. If you want to see something or you're not sure about something, but yeah. during the game, you come off that fucking ice, catch your breath, take some water and get your ass ready to go back on the ice. Boom. Yeah. I, I, I can't stand that fucking iPad thing. I, I can't either because how, how many times, how many more times in that game is that same situation that they're watching going to happen? Probably not likely. Like yeah. everything's yeah. different. It's like, what is watching? They want to look at themselves. <laughs> they do. I know oh, what, what I do. Oh, how can I deacon better? Dude? Fuck off. I agree. I, I say it. I can't. Bunch of, bunch of shit. I can't stand it. Um, uh, we got uh, Freedom Dagger again says, Bob Ganey is pure class. Awesome. Bob yeah. Ganey, good man. Good man. Saying, nice to hear that yep. they helped. Uh, friend of the show, former Montreal Canadian draft pick, Graham Bonner watching. Graham, says, how are you, bud? Bones. Says, Graham. He's he's also uh I can say this because yeah, he's been showing recovery. You know, he's a he's yeah. a he's a friend. He's a friend. Yeah. He shared yeah. his story on this show coming up to uh 26, I think. 27, maybe. Uh sorry I'm getting late here. Love you guys both. Two of my favorite guys. Uh people from Sober is Cool, which is one of the biggest uh social media pages for sobriety. They're watching uh great people over there. It says legends. Thanks for this. Uh Graham also says proud of both of you guys warms my heart and uh sober brothers uh he Graham giving a shout out to them as well um brody watching says that's it knuckles one day at a time one day at a time keep fighting the battle appreciate how pure and honest you've been together as well as telling your story um we got Thanks, david Carlson. we got david carlson out there in saint albert alberta says agreed the government wants us divided we should not be fighting each other we're we're simpatico, Chris. Great, we're great interview, Chris. Thank you very much, guys. Um, Stuart, assistant fire chief in Abbotsford, also uh, one of my good friends, says my dog is my therapist, which he tells me every day. He's like, I'm out for a walk with my therapist. He texts me pictures <laughs> of his dog. We we walk, I talk, he listens every single day. Yeah. And uh, we got Jason Beaupre says support dogs are the best. And Jeff O'Neill loved watching him fight. Plus, he could play talking about you, of course, because you you could score too. You were uh, you were an all star too, right, Knuckles? Yeah, uh, yeah. That was that was a gift from Mike Milbury. Um, I wasn't an all star, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Before I let you go, um, I hope we can do this again sometime at, at some point in the future. Um, where can people where can people catch your show? Is there a certain date that it comes out on? Uh, comes out on Wednesdays. We a new episode every Wednesday. Um, Tim and I, you can catch it on, you know, wherever you watch your podcast, whether it's Spotify, uh, uh, you, YouTube, um, iTunes, whatever. And yeah, all, all the sites. So, um, yeah, we're kicking it off. It's going good. Uh, every Wednesday we, we come out with a new one and it just, I, it's, just lining guests up i'm on the phone constantly calling people and it's crazy crazy <laughs> trying to it's, get people to it's come fun on. though right it's a it's a yeah, good I way love it. people I love again when you right? get them on there and you're able to really just get it going and have that conversation uh i have fun with it i have big john scott on yeah recently. i, I love i loved that good. episode i loved that episode i loved it so much the john scott one uh you guys i guess what is it and i have your boy who is also my boy coming on, uh, uh, Ted Nolan, uh, oh, who's yes. on your show. And Ted yes. and I, and you, you don't know, but, um, and I talked to him the other day, I told him how much I have admired him since the first time I ever saw him. And he was playing in Adirondack with the Red Wings, and I was playing with the Nova Scotia Voyagers. And he scored two goals that night, and he had two fights. And I'm like, man, this kid is tough. And then I followed him the rest of that year in the league, and he just um, he impressed me. I really like what I saw on the ice. He's a native kid, um, and and um, you know the kid's been through a lot growing up in hockey back in that day, and the shit he had to put up with to try and get to the NHL, and then certainly. An awesome coach, Ted Nolan. 
too, and the shit he had to put up with there. But the one thing I know about Ted and what happened in Buffalo is not what everybody says happened. Um, they're so full of shit with the rumors. Ted um, Ted Nolan is a really super guy, really um, a good person, really good person. Yeah, I had the uh, the opportunity to have him on, as you said, and get to know him. And, uh, you know, I just I can't say enough about him, too. And all uh, people are already saying that yep, Ted is one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'll be watching. Matthew says three Nolan's hockey clinic does great stuff. And he says, I'll be listening to that one for sure. Um, anything else we want to cover, Knuckles, before uh, we let you go? No, well, good. I love to fish. I'm a fishing fool. Are you? Um, yeah, I, I just tell you, I'll give you a little. Uh, who do we got? I got Tim Peel coming up on my part, the former ref. I got Ted Nolan. I'm going to have Clint Malachuk. Nice. Uh, Jeremy Roenick, Max Pacioretty, Brendan Gallagher, all coming up uh, in the next few months here. Uh, weeks, That's sorry. Uh, so, yeah, we're just trying to. Trying to get that variety, which you know, it's like always banging on the door, you know. The three That's Nolan's hockey clinic. Yep. Great yeah. stuff is right, Matthew. So that's uh that's a pretty that's a pretty great lineup you got i i'm a huge brennan gallagher fan uh, he's from not where How i'm can't from. you be i know right, right? <laughs> we're from the same area ish he's a little bit younger than i am uh but what an what an incredible so uh, where are you you're up in in muskoka right now yeah i'm in i'm in muskoka but i'm from out west i'm from near vancouver like yeah. i was I was homeless on Hastings in Vancouver yeah. for like a year, right? Like, then yeah. I, I had to get the hell out of there. But I'll tell you, I went back down. I went back there uh, very recently, and I went back down to Hastings, and I spent the day handing out sandwiches and water and talking with people, and you know, being able to show them, you know, because my my arms are scarred still from from living that oh, life. God bless right? you. But it but it was able to resonate with them because I was like, yo, look, I was here, and I could show them, and. Um, Felt really good to be able to go back into the the old war zone, and then might you move back out there one day? I love Muskoka, man. I yeah. love I love oh, Muskoka. I, I don't know if I don't know if it gets much better than this. I, I if you could give me a place in Kelowna, in like near Big White, up in the bush somewhere, that might be mm -hmm. the only play, way to get me out there. But I got family back home, so I'm talking about it anyways. I love British Columbia. Uh, if if I lived anywhere else other than where i'm at right now uh jamie's from hawaii and yeah. um you know we spent some time there but i love british columbia i love salmon fishing i love vancouver island i love campbell river i love uh, haida Gwaii. uh i just butte inlet i've been i i i just love it out there you ever uh, gone surgeon fishing i've been i've been in um the columbia river in astoria oregon but i i'm not big on that you know I want to catch a Volkswagen. I'll hook my <laughs> my rod up to the back of a Volkswagen and 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 try and tug one of them around. Honestly, I love salmon fishing. I love marlin fishing. I love tuna fishing. Yeah. Um, and I love bass fishing local here. I freshwater fishing it was all new to me when I moved back to Montreal because I was always saltwater stuff. Um, Jay Miller actually introduced me to all that tuna fishing and shark fishing down in in cape cod but um, that would be yeah that's yeah. a dream that's a dream I've, I've never done that but uh but if i had one thing left to do i could only pick one thing to do i'd go to haida Gwaii. yeah and i would go for king salmon yeah. all day every day the, the best just best spot in the world i love it love it yeah i've never been up there my dad and i talked about going up there like when i was like 10 Thanks for bringing that up again. I'm going to tell him, hey, we're going there to Haida Gwaii. Go. Let's, let's go. go, Dad. Come on. We're going to Haida Gwaii. Maybe we'll meet Knuckles up there. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, All buddy. Right. Listen, I, I really appreciate you. And uh, from from somebody who's gone through similar things, I know how hard it is. And I'm so proud of you. And I look up to you, man. And, uh, you know, I'm here. If you ever need to chat, I know you got a community of amazing yeah. people. But uh, yeah, you yeah, yeah. Come over here. Well, listen, God bless you. I wish you all the best, Brady. And I'm so happy you're a sober man today. And uh, I wish you well with the podcast. And maybe one day here, um, we're going to have you on uh, the Ron Knuckles podcast for sure. Okay, uh, you you tell me when and I'm, I'm there, man. I'm there. I will, I'd I will be, be in touch.
the Raw Knuckles podcast. Make sure you guys go like, subscribe, share, find it on YouTube, find it on Spotify, find it on Apple Podcasts. And honestly, do yourself a favor. Like I said earlier, follow this man on social media. I'm not kidding. He just you just kill me every day. So thank uh-huh. you. Keep it up, man. You're you're doing it right, man. Don't change. Be you. We all love you, Knuckles. Thank you so much. And uh, tell Tim Stapleton I said hi. And I hopefully maybe maybe we can get you two on the show down the You'll road. You'll see us. You'll see us again. Looking forward to it, buddy. You have a great day, man. All right. Take care. Thanks, Brady. Thank you. All right, guys. That's Chris Knuckles Nylon, one of my favorites. What a legend. An absolute legend. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our good friends at pride tape remember it is pride month um before i i don't want to take anything away from pride month but i just want to remind everybody that just because there's a certain day or a certain month being celebrated that that doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be that for the other 364 days a year this is something we talk about mental health we talk about addiction we talk about pride all of these topics need to be paid attention to each and every single day not just one day not just one month although i know that these days and these months being celebrated do a lot of good we still have to remember that it's so much more than just one day pocket of hell and back is brought to you by pride tape Pride Tape is a badge of support from teammates, coaches, parents, and pros to young LGBTQ players. It shows every player that they belong playing the sport they love and that we're all on the same team. Show your support for teammates, coaches, and fans in the LGBTQ community by wrapping your stick with Pride Tape. Every roll of tape will make an impact in sports and beyond. Inclusion starts with leadership. Check out some of the ideas of how you can get involved at youcanplayproject.org. Check out Pride Tape, pridetape.com. For more information, you can send an email to Aubrey at pridetape.com. That's A-U-B-R-E-E, Aubrey at pridetape.com. You can find Pride Tape on facebook.com slash pride tape, on Twitter at pride tape, and at pride tape on Instagram. Pride Tape thanks all of you for being champions for change. Thank you to the great people at Pride Tape, Dean and Jeff, doing amazing work. I am an ally. I always have Pride Tape on my stick. And this is a one for the podcast set. But this is just a way to, to show, you know, to stand up for me. Pride Tape is about so much more. It's just about kindness and love and acceptance anti-bullying all of it that's what i think of when i when i have pride tape on my stick it's like everybody's welcome we love everybody doesn't matter your your age your race your sexual orientation none of it it is all love it is all love and until the end of june so for like another 10 days anybody that Orders Pucks Bar, I think it was from June 15th on, I want to say. No, June 10th on. Squirrel. Just kidding. I have a hard time keeping focused sometimes. ADHD. It's real. Um, every order, every Puck Support it order is going to get a roll of Pride Tape. I hear banging coming from upstairs because I said squirrel, I think. Um it's just a way, you know, put it on your stick, put it on the knob of your stick as a, as a sign of solidarity. And while you're at it, get yourself a puck support sticker for your helmet to show that you stand for people's mental health and uh, that you're a safe place and that, you know, you're doing what you can to, to be there for others and to educate yourself. Uh, and we're certainly working on things on puck support to make that easier for everybody pucksupport.com if you like my hoodie pain is real but so is hope we have a whole bunch of stuff but i gotta show you guys this i'm sorry if you're listening to the audio our friend Stuart smith just texted me that he said twins no joke he's holding his phone watching my podcast and he's got the same hoodie i have on (laughs) 
Stuart's going to be a grandpa soon. Hello to Stuart and Allie, Tobin and Peyton. I love you, Stuart. You're the man. Twinning, always. Pucksupport.com. Thank you to everybody who's supported us. Thank you to the great people at True Temper Hockey. If you're listening or watching this, if you have a kid, a son, a daughter uh, that's looking for some skills training, I'm so happy to be able to sit here. I could almost cry. I'm so happy to be able to say that I'm back on the ice coaching kids. I talked about it last episode, but what an amazing place to be. Brody Kerbison was out Friday with myself and Dan Spence. Lucas Mackey was on the ice with a few others. Thank you to Brody for coming out and uh, helping me coach um, and uh, just supporting me and taking pictures and videos. Uh, it uh, It's always better when you have friends around. That's what I found. And uh, that's certainly the case with guys like Dan and Brody, a couple of my best friends in the world. And just to be on the ice, you know. <laughs> Even when I first pressed record on the first episode of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery, over two years ago, I never thought it would ever be possible for me to be back on the ice in and around children, youth, coaching hockey, because I just thought, what parent would ever trust me around their kids when I can't even see my own kids? That was my mentality at the time. And I'll tell you, there has been so many doors that have opened and people have been so kind and so gracious. Sorry, my screen closed there for a second. And receptive and open. And you know what I come to find? Most of these parents have either gone through something or have somebody in their life going through something. And so, though I don't like to hear that, It makes it easier to talk about, not just for me, but for them. And in turn, I hope that that can save lives, that that can help stop just some of the misery that's going on in this world through mental illness and addiction and the stigma that comes with it, especially addiction, especially addiction. The next time you want to judge somebody who's in addiction, stop yourself and instead of judging them, Ask yourself, why is this person maybe doing drugs in the first place? Is it because they're a bad person? No. It's likely because they had some horrible shit happen to them that they never learned how to deal with. And the pain is so immense that they don't know what else to do. So when they find substances, when I found substances, to me it was like the answer. Even though it wasn't, because it was misery too. But at least it didn't feel like reality. So let's stop judging one another and let's start asking why or how can I help? Let's lift people up instead of kicking them down. And I'll sit here and be perfectly honest with you guys. Not so much when it comes to people who are homeless, drug addicted, or mentally ill, because I don't judge people like that anymore at all. But there was a time in my life that I did, having gone through it now and lost so many friends and people I care about and knowing so many people that I love and care about who are in it right now. That's just not me. But I still judge people when I'm out and about. But you want to know what? Something has changed for me. When I've had these thoughts of judgment, you know, and they come in, sometimes I verbalize them if some, I'm with somebody. Oftentimes I don't. But even when I do, I now find that I retract my statement and say, you know, I really shouldn't say that. I really shouldn't judge people because. So I default mode to judging. But I now have the wherewithal and the awareness to understand that that doesn't serve that person and it certainly doesn't serve me and I actually have no idea what may be going on for that person. So I think there's something to that and I'm really proud of myself to be able to acknowledge that, not proud that I'm still in some cases judging, but understanding the my character defects and or things that come out and being able to 
not just be aware, but put into action and stop myself and then have a conversation and, and with myself. It, it may sound crazy. Maybe I'm not making sense, but I think it's really, really, really important. Anyways, we got Doug Eaton watching lunch tomorrow with Elaine. Elaine, come on up from Orangeville. I'll call you after the show. You got a whole bunch of puck support stuff to pick up, Elaine. Elaine is very, very close to puck support. Her and her partner, Doug, who is watching. Doug Eaton, hello. Hope you guys are feeling well, and I hope all is well down there. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Just because I have this here for people watching, I was looking at this, and I don't even know why this is here. This is a photo album from, from when I was a little kid. And uh, there's some beauty pictures. Some beauty pictures in here for sure. Check me out is in my little Superman outfit. I called myself Cooper boy because I couldn't say super. It's kind of funny. My aunt still makes fun of me. Anyways, that's it. We'll be back next Monday night. I think with Tony Hoffman. Is it Tony Hoffman? That's on next week. Uh, former uh, BMX gold medalist who spent time in prison, addicted, and is now one of the best and most sought after speakers when it comes to a comeback story, addiction, jail, mental health, and uh, what he accomplished coming out of jail, winning a, a gold, like just incredible story, incredible story. So hopefully he's going to be here next Monday. If something changes, we'll still be here. I'll have somebody on here and we'll be talking a lot about the same stuff. If you're watching on YouTube, please press like, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Please tell your friends if you're watching on Facebook, if you have 10 seconds that you could spare, please go subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm going to leave all my social media handles in the description. But for those watching, you'll see it uh, at the end here. And there's ways that if you want to support the podcast through Patreon, patreon.com slash Brady Level, there's not much going on there. But any money for there that I make uh, helps cover the cost of, of this show, the programs that I use, and et cetera, et cetera. I hate asking but I'm just putting it out there. But I am going to do more with Patreon. I'm going to start writing in there and start sharing some stories that I've never shared before. So if you want more, that's a good place to, to start. Anyways, thank you to Chris Knuckles and Island. Thank you to everyone for watching, everyone for listening. Happy Father's Day to all the wonderful dads out there and uh, to my kids that I haven't seen. I'm not going to use their name. But I love you. And every Father's Day is extremely difficult for me, though I'm grateful for what I have in my life. There is a massive, massive piece of my heart missing. And uh, I just love you guys. And uh, if you hear this or see this, I'm here anytime. I love you so much. Anyways, that's it for me. Until next time, be kind to everybody. Find gratitude, even if you're having a shitty day and you think it's just the worst, I promise you, you can find something to be grateful for. Take it a step further, write down three things you're grateful for every day. Anyways, until next time, guys, remember, make it a great day if you so choose. I want the real stuff, everybody listen up Cause I'll only say it once, I'm gonna show you all the path If you want it bad, I'm gonna show you every side Yeah, how you can get it back, yeah, cause I ain't never done I'll be number one, working
can nail the heart until I get just what I want, yeah. Rise just like the sun, yeah. Fatal like a gun. Shooter's gonna shoot and I'm gonna shoot until I fall. I'm always do it on my own, so I gotta get through it. And the only thing I know is to love what I'm doing. Never give up, never slow till I finally prove it. Never listen to the no's, I just wanna keep moving. Yeah, I put out all the heart, it's my only medicine, yeah. Everything I do, I'm just being genuine, yeah. I'm sick of being screwed, feel my own adrenaline, yeah. I do just what I do, and I hope you let me in, let me in, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, no label. Oh, yeah, you know me. I have only the best. I'm lonely, but damn, I'm going to win. 